All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. We've got uh, uh, people who just came back with us on the great trolley tour. Special thanks to uh, borough manager um, Justin Keller for leading that tour and showing us a lot of the great things Pottstown has done on bike and pet infrastructure. Um, we also have a virtual audience with us tonight uh, coming in on Zoom, so speaking to both audiences. And I just want to, again, welcome and thank everyone for attending. This is our uh, second of our educational series on planning smarter for the year uh, on strategies to enhance walking and bicycling in your community. And I hope you had a great time on the tour, those who are here. Pottstown has been on the forefront of civic investments in pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure for two decades. They're a leader, not just in Montgomery County, but the Delaware Valley as a whole. And I think that was quite apparent in, uh, in our tour. Uh, we've been able to honor their leadership just a couple years ago with the Montgomery Award for the Borough's Walk Bike Pottstown Project, and uh, well-deserved. Uh, in addition, I mentioned on the tour, the Monco 2040 Implementation Grant Program is a great uh, resource, uh, funding re money resource uh, for municipalities trying to get uh, new pedestrian or, or bicycle projects in. It's the most popular project category in that annual funding program. Uh, so we encourage uh, anyone in the municipal environment or talking to your officials uh, not to miss out on that uh, annual uh, opportunity. Montgomery County has spent the years since the adoption of our last comprehensive plan in 2015 working on promoting better bicycling and pedestrian infrastructure. Our two plans, Bike Monco and Walk Monco, set the stage for the future of active transportation in the county and the county's subsequent complete streets policy makes planning for all modes of transportation an important part of all our county-owned transportation upgrades and construction projects. And we're able to work with local municipalities uh, like Pottstown to help plan for their own walking and biking needs, such as with our safe routes to school audits and sidewalk infrastructure analyses. This is not to minimize what's being done locally. Uh, all, of, all of the people who are working hard at the grassroots level really make a lot of this happen. And we're here tonight to learn from several partner municipalities about the keys to their success as they expand their walking and bicycling network. Uh, tonight, you'll first hear from Upper Providence Township and Jeff Grace about the foundational role of good bicycle and pedestrian planning. Then some uh, residents of Narberth Borough will explain how they build a civic culture around bicycling and walking and how the grassroots support is, uh, that it created is allowing them to innovate. And then finally, we'll bring it back to Pottstown uh, where Justin and his uh, uh, crew will tell us about the triumphs and tribulations of designing, funding, and building actual on the ground infrastructure. So we're very excited to bring these experiences to you. I'm gonna introduce, uh, although those here I've already met, Matt Edmond, our Assistant Director of Transportation and Long Range Planning. He's going to be your MC for the rest of the evening and uh, take it away, Matt. Sure, good evening everyone. Thank you very much. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, our first speaker is Jeff Grace, and my role here is to basically introduce the speakers as they come up, so you guys have a little bit of context of who they are. So Jeff, why don't you head on up here. Uh, Jeff is the owner and the principal of Grace Planning Associates. He's also a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners. For the past 20 years, he has been a planning consultant for Upper Providence Township, and five years ago, he entered an arrangement to be their on-site director of planning and zoning. Uh, as their main zoning officer. He's currently working very hard on a, uh, a new comprehensive plan for the township. So with that, Jeff, take it away. Hi, nice to see everybody today. Um, as, as Matt introduced, I'm, I'm the, the transfer or the, the planning director for Upper Providence Township. And to give you a little bit of background about Upper Providence Township, sort of mid lower county of, of Montgomery County, um, we've been one of the highest highest growth count highest growth townships in in the county and in the region for the probably the past 20 years. Uh, as you can see here, you know, from 1990 to 2000, 59% growth, slowed down a little bit between 20, 2010 and, or 2000, 2010. And in the last 20 years, we're, we're still around 14%. Um, we are getting close to being built out. Um, we only have one parcel that's, that's a really a, a large developable parcel. 
And fortunately or unfortunately, it's, it's under application right now for about 1,200 units. So, you know, we're, we're running out of property, we're running out of land. Um, we have a, a few other smaller parcels, but as with any municipality like this, as you get down to the last few parcels, the, the development and, and building on those is much more of a challenge. Um, the township itself is bordered on two sides by the Perkiomen Creek on the east. You can see that on the, on the right side of the screen there. And then on the Schuylkill River on the south. Um, and then also 422 cuts us in half. It, there's only three pathways, four roads that go through. And, you know, generally the top half and the, and the bottom half are, are completely separated from each other. Uh, we're primarily single family detached. We are home to a couple large office developments. We have a, a Pfizer Dow office campus, a GlaxoSmithKline campus, SEI makes its headquarters there, um, and Quest. Uh, we have a large um, entertainment and industrial sort of complex at, at 422 Business Center. You may know that where Arnold's is, if you've seen that coming into, into, four, into the township. And, you know, we've done well with open space. We, um, there's 5.2% of the township is open space. We're running around, I think our last tabulation was around 185 acres to around 200 acres of open space. Um, and that's just township owned. When you consider what we keep in the HOA or the Commonwealth or Montgomery County, you know, we have a significant amount of open space, even for being as developed as we are. Um, we're somewhat of a regional trail nexus. On the, the right side of the screen there, that large heavy green line is the Perkiomen Trail. You can start at the bottom of our township at where um, at 422 and, and Black Rock Road basically, and walk all the way up to Douglasville, Red Hill, you know, take the Perkiomen Trail all the way up. And then the other trail is the Schuylkill Trail. You can walk from here, from that same point to go all the way into Philadelphia or all the way out here to Pottstown. Um, again, 422 is cutting that effectively in half. What happens is, we have a lot of, we have the regional trails, but we don't have any way to get our own residents there. We don't have a lot of connection between our, our subdivisions to the parks, to the trails. Um, the issue that we, we tend to run into is that uh, a lot of the subdivisions when they were planned and when they were built back in the late nineties, early two thousands, they became islands that rarely does a sidewalk leave it and connect to another development. I could cite you the reasons why, but generally that's just sort of the, 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 the die has been cast at this point. So we're, we're working towards connecting back through these subdivisions and major roadways to get people from those subdivisions out to the, the regional trails. Um, in starting with our plan development, you know, as Matt said, we're, we're working on the comprehensive plan, but we've also recently done a, a, an active transportation plan, a complete streets manual, um, we're working, we've worked on a park master plan. Um, so we're sort of compiling all of these documents together, but we've started with like a 15 year old trail master plan, a comprehensive plan that was 10 years old. Again, we're rewriting that, you know, the older park and rec plan, a 14 year old official map that really almost is laughable when, when I look at it on my wall now, and then a trail priority memo that was nothing more than me looking to say, hey, to the board, what can we do? Because we were sort of between park and rec directors and everybody was saying, well, we need trails, we need trails. And there was no priorities, no, there was no co cohesiveness on, on how the board and how the planning commission and how I spoke about trails. Um, so just to look at the funding of, of how we, we sort of got to where we get to, um, the, the active transportation plan was funded through grants. We got $15,000 from WalkWorks another, I think, $10,000 from DCNR peer grant, um, which was great. It really funded the effort and it, it's given us a, a nice cohesive voice on a, on a lot of this. Um, I don't need to, we don't need to really go into the details of what all of this is, but this is sort of the, the, the summary of the plan. You know, we come down with priority one, priority two, ongoing trail efforts and ongoing trail improvements. But it, when you go back to the, to the main map of the township here, if you look basically dead center of the city, there's a dead center of the township, there's a thick black, brown, blue line. That's our Providence Town Center. It's, it's almost geographically the center of our township. But again, there's no way to walk there from any of these subdivisions. And, and that's what a lot of the, 
active transportation plan is looking to do and a lot of where our trail effort is looking to do to connect those areas. Um, and again, we have older areas. We're bordered by oaks um, on, on the eastern side and the Rorschach borough on, on the western side. And those are older areas. Most of the homes in there are built in the, in the anywhere between the 20s and the 50s. And they don't have a lot of sidewalks and they were never built with sidewalks. So we're trying to, we're trying to, to fit in pedestrian amenities where, you know, when we look at it, we're taking out three mailboxes, four decorative walk, rock walls, and, and, you know, someone's bench that they use for when they pick their kid up from school while they wait for the kid from school. So this, what this generated was a complete streets policy of, of saying, look, anytime we do anything with the streets, whether that's repaving or, or um, other development, is we really look at, to look at comp creating a complete street. We protect the environment. We improve safety. We think it, we think it'll stimulate the economy, promote wellness, and promote equitable transportation options through here. The, the plan will move us forward and it creates partnerships a, a, along the way. Um, it's also, we have a two year implementation policy procedure. In year one, we, we create, we, we decide what trails we're going to design. We have our engineering staff, our engineering consultant, both traffic and, and civil, design a, a section of our trails. Because what we're running into is we're, we have a lot of trails that don't go anywhere. We have the Perkyoman and the, and, the, and, and the Schuylkill, but we run into a lot of areas where, like if you look at the picture here, just about where that white house is at the end is where the trail ends. It just ends. <laughs> you know, unfortunately, we, we don't have a lot of connectivity. So we've been trying to come up with these plans to say, here's how we will connect them. And what those plans have been allowed us to do is, is as Scott had mentioned earlier, the Monco 2040 grant, they've been great. We've been able to use, leverage that to connect a lot of these trails. On the left here, you see a connection between Black Rock Park and the Schuylkill River Trail. And once this trail was complete, I think we'll have the ribbon, ribbon cutting in the fall to this year, but once this trail was complete, you're able to walk from just generally anywhere sort of south of 422 going east towards Oaks down to the trail and connect again to Pottstown to Philadelphia. Um, over here on the right, the Perkyoman Trail, the grant we received from the county in 2021 was um, a crossing that, that when you, if you drive the, on, on this part of Cider Mill Road, it's a blind crossing and, and you know, we encouraging the trail through here, it, it's extremely difficult. And, and we're trying to leverage that to improve the existing trail conditions in, in, in this area. And again, this also allows for improvement of a, of a trail connection from when you're looking at it, the going east on Arcola Road. Other grants we've received and other grants we've looked at, um, there's a Montgomery County Trail grant that's allowing us again to connect a, a, a small, an area that's probably less than 500 feet long. But once we connect that up, and once we connect that up, we will be able to actually have a full connection between the Perkyoman Trail and the Schuylkill River Trail. So that instead of walking, you know, all the way around the outside of the township, you can actually cut through the middle of the township and, and walk through there. Um, we've also used the, the active transportation plan to look at um, a, an, inter, an intersection of the township that, that really needs a lot of work. And that's the Dravelvis Road here in 2nd Avenue. Um, that's the local share grant. Um, we're waiting on a few others, Commonwealth Financing Authority for some other trail connections, uh, Greenlight Go, We've recently ran into a little bit of a, um, a, a, a hiccup because we were talking to Pico about using a lot of uh, part of their ground. They have a very long um, right of way in our township or power line right of way in our township. And we were looking to, to, to work with them to create just a, a very long trail segment. And unfortunately, as we were talking to them, they came out with their policy saying, we're no longer putting trails in our easements. And, and so we're scrambling a little bit, but that was one of our main north-south connections. Um, overall, what the plans have done is they've allowed us a lot of leverage with developers, builders. Um, when someone comes in, whether it's, it's for pre-meeting or to the planning commission or the board of supervisors, we're all on the same page with what the plan, with what our planning effort is and where we wanna connect trails. 
on this plan here, when you look at the light blue lines, those are all trails that developers are building for us in the next, I would say, six months to a year. And it also includes, more than likely, it's going to include a, a trailhead parking area in this area. Everything you see in orange, which I grant is probably a little hard to see on that screen, is township property. So from the north, you're connecting Taylor Farm down to a township piece of property, down to a Hess Preserve, through a residential development. And you know it's, it's allowing us to, once we connect this up, you'll be able to walk from the north bottleneck of the township almost all the way down to the township building at Black Rock Park. Um, there's one small area and that's sort of where we're, we're haggling about now of, of we'd like the developer to build it for us. But if not, I, I know the supervisors are, are encouraged by this and wanna see this connection. Um, it, it really has been, it, creating the plans that really has allowed us to speak with one voice and, and allowed us to move things forward when we know we just have gaps in our, in our system and, and it leverages everything for us. So that's what I have, if there's any other questions. All right, thank you, Jeff. We'll go with this one. There we go. I just realized I had a handheld mic in this mic and you know the chance of feedback is a little too high. So we'll just go with this one here. So thank you, Anna. Um, so uh, Jeff was able to talk to us a little bit tonight about all the planning work that Upper Providence has been doing. And honestly, Upper Providence has really been taking the lead on planning work for active transportation here in our county the last couple of years. They really are out in front in, in, in their active transportation plans, their complete streets policy, going after grants, all the things uh, that you saw and heard Jeff just talk about. So we're gonna shift gears a little bit now and we're gonna talk about what it takes to create a, a walking and bicycling culture in your community. And so we brought two people with us here today, uh, Samantha Bryant, who is the uh, borough manager of Narberth and Kimberly Bizak, who is the president and founder of the Narberth Cycling Club. And together they're gonna to talk about the things that Narberth have been doing to, to create that culture, that grassroots support ultimately that you need in a community in order to make these, these larger scale efforts successful. A couple of things about Samantha, she's been the borough manager in Narberth since May of 2021. Before that, she spent a number of years uh, as the borough manager in New Britain in Bucks County. And she has some street cred. Um, in New Britain, she worked on the construction of bike trails and uh, an active transportation plan for that borough. And more importantly, in her personal life, she also owns an electric bike that she enjoys riding from her residence in Bell Kinwood uh, to Narberth and Maniunk. And Kimberly, like I said, is the founder of the Narberth Cycling Club. Uh, what that does is it's an all ages, all abilities club, uh, really uh, rallies together the, uh, the, the folks in Narberth who are, who are excited and passionate about bicycling around and finding other ways to get around besides driving. And she founded it in 2017. And so they're committed to ensuring that bicycling is safe and accessible for everyone in their community. And they advocate for local bicycle improvements uh, in and around Narberth. So with that, uh, Samantha is going to be online and I'll invite Kimberly up here to the podium. Hi there, thanks Matt for the introduction. I, in addition to running Narberth Cycling Club, I'm also a business owner in Narberth. So it's really helpful, I think, to share the perspective of being on the civic community and business side of the table when working with borough government. So in 2016, just a little bit about the state of biking in Narberth. Surprisingly, despite being a very compact borough of about 4,200 residents and covering a footprint of only about a half square mile, not a lot of folks were using bicycles for transportation. Narberth has always had an identity of being a very walkable town and folks completing errands or walking into town for coffee or a baguette, um, but not necessarily hopping on their bike to travel from their house to downtown. What I learned upon moving to Narberth in 2014, coming from areas in the country where I was used to biking everywhere for transportation, I saw lots of untapped potential. Whereas talking to residents there, they did not see that potential. They had, you know, 
I guess, seen their streets in a much different way. So the common practice at the time around bicycling was putting your bike on the back of your car, driving two miles to the circuit trails network and riding your bike. So the potential was there to create some connectivity around biking to take cars out of the equation. When I learned about this plan in 2007 called Bike Narberth and read through it, I couldn't believe that way back in 2007, Narberth was really taking a thoughtful, progressive approach to using a bicycle to get around town. But I was disappointed to learn it had never been implemented. So a lot of work had gone into that plan and then it sat on the shelf. But through some conversations between myself and borough leadership, um, it inspired this idea for what I call advocacy and action. And I realized if we could just start empowering folks to get on their bike, that in itself would help create a culture for biking in Narber. So um, I had this walk and talk meeting with our borough manager with our borough council president at the time about how borough council could, could start to support bicycle improvements. And the takeaway from that conversation was for Narberth being a tiny municipality with very limited funds, we had to take a unique approach of building what I call the human and cultural infrastructure so that that would lay the groundwork for the physical improvements. So in 2017, Narber Cycling Club was created. And over the past five years, we've been heavily involved in creating that human and cultural infrastructure of biking in Narber. And Narber is really now known as a biking town. So this timeline shows um, a little bit about how we got there. So at Narber's annual Earth Day event, the cycling club began to do a one day bikeway demonstration. So being an Earth Day event, it was really easy to sell it. Don't drive to Earth Day, walk or bike. We provided free bike valet parking and folks that came to the event could could practice in real time riding in a protected cycle track. That was a pop-up just for the day. So it was really well received. It was getting a lot of attention from borough leadership. And then that really started creating some momentum to start talking about how bicycles could fit into municipal planning. So as you see, there was a parking study done in 2018 a comprehensive plan with assistance from Montgomery County Planning Commission. Um, and those plans, again, create an, created an opportunity for Narber Cycling Club to come to the table and to really create a partner, partnership that was essential for thinking about how bicycling fits into the picture. Um, the Windsor Avenue uh, workshop was something that was started as a community conversation and turned into a borough led initiative. So Windsor Avenue is one of the main streets in Narberth Borough. It has a very old fashioned layout with two way traffic parking on both sides. And the interesting thing that came out of the visioning workshops around Windsor Avenue was that the community actually was expressing that they didn't want to keep prioritizing parking. They really wanted to start prioritizing moving people around the borough and not necessarily storing cars. So that was a really pivotal moment. Um, flash forward to the COVID lockdown when everyone was sick of being stuck in their tiny houses in Narber. Um, it really, again, helped fuel the conversation around our streets being a public amenity that were worthwhile thinking about beyond moving cars around. With assistance from DVRPC's Expo program, 
the Wheels on Windsor pilot happened in 2020 and it took Windsor Avenue and that visioning session and transformed it into a 10 day pilot project, which allowed uh, a practice run on what some bicycle infrastructure could look like in Narber. And the results of that were really powerful. It also led to this second pop-up demonstration project that happened earlier um, in 2021 called Wheels on Haverford, which is on another core street in the borough. So really the key takeaways for me is that government and community partnerships really are essential. So just at the ground level, finding um, civic or community activists to partner with and get that buy-in has been really key for Narberth to start seeing momentum and action around these plans. And the small um, incremental actions and doing these pilot projects where we've been able to try on some of these physical improvements before we actually make them permanent has really helped build support in the community. So Narber Cycling Club, as Matt said, we're, we're not your average bicycle club. Um, I professionally am an occupational therapist and I've always focused on how to create opportunities for folks of all ages, all levels to participate in things that they desire to participate in. So Narber Cycling Club has taken a very um, fun but functional approach to bicycling as transportation. So every Monday we lead a, what we call bike to groceries. So we meet in the center of town and we bike about two miles to the local farmer's market as a group and folks do their shopping. And then we bike back to Narberth together. Again, just building that culture around bicycling has helped build that human and cultural infrastructure. Then we also do fun stuff. We do a holiday lights ride every year. And despite the cold temperatures, we usually have about a hundred people show up to that ride. Um, it ends with hot chocolate. Again, just making it really fun to get out on your bike and ride on the streets and learn how to share the streets with traffic. Um, we do a costume ride. We do a Cranksgiving, which is a fundraiser for the Narberth Community Food Bank. And we've also done a lot of other wacky rides that people have requested. We've biked to yoga. We've biked to Ikea, which was a really fun ride. And folks actually bought stuff and hauled it home on their bikes. Um, we bike to the bike expo, anything that people have sent my way, we've made it into a ride and it really has helped to create this culture around biking for transportation in Narber. So the borough again has taken a bit of an unusual approach to developing the physical infrastructure and through some support of a Montco 2040 grant, the borough was able to, I, I guess, get a shovel in the ground in a very non-controversial way. So instead of putting in bike lanes first, the conversation shifted towards, let's, let's think about this in a different way. What's not so controversial? How about a bicycle fix-it station in the center of town? How about adding a bicycle tire pump or a water bottle filling station? So those were things that we applied for in a grant. Narberth Borough wrote the grant. The cycling club gave some feedback. And the, as a result of being awarded the grant, we were able to add modernized bicycle racks at all of our community amenities to encourage people to people that were feeling confident on a bike to bike to the train station instead of driving, or bike to the park, bike to the library, bike to Borough Hall. And again, just we started to see with those tiny improvements, a shift in behaviors. People started to leave their cars at home and ride their bicycle to these community destinations. In downtown, um, 
we installed what are called meter hit tracks. So we have the old fashioned parking meters still in the ground that are, are starting to be phased out. But we added what's called a hit track. And now you, at most of the shops downtown, you can pull right up to the meter right out front and get what we call VIP parking. It's free. Again, it's just another way to encourage people to bike downtown instead of driving and having to um, hunt for parking. And with DVRPC's expo program, we received um, planning assistance to start doing bicycle lane pilots. Again, just trying on the on-road improvements as a way to figure out what the right fit was for Narber. So the one that we did with assistance from DVRPC is called Wheel, was called Wheels on Windsor. It was a 10 day pilot. And we did lots of education through these infographic flyers that were placed all around town, as well as at the pilot site. And the QR code allowed people to participate in a survey which collected data. DVRPC assisted with traffic counts, bicycle counts, and tweaking the design over the 10 days. That way at the end of the pilot, Narberth had a nice complete plan for a possible future implementation. They had worked at the kinks and found a custom fit plan for that corridor. That really did help fuel the decision by borough council to do a second pilot after seeing the survey results showing that the community wanted another pilot in town. So in 2021, Wheels on Haverford, which is our main street where our downtown business di district is, Haverford was, um, has a section just outside of downtown that links the community to Narberth Park and the library, the tennis courts, all of our recreational areas. So we piloted um, a different type of infrastructure. Um, we did a contraflow lane because it's a one-way street. We were able to test some ideas, collect data, gather feedback, and people could go out there and actually see it and try it. It was really powerful. Um, so again, collecting data from that. The public survey results showed, again, not only changes in behavior, but changes in perception around what the community wanted. From 2016, where no one in the community would have even thought about biking around for transportation, we then saw this really big shift in thinking and future forward thinking around the fact that, you know, hopping on the bike is one less car on the road, one less, one less burden on our parking in our borough. So you'll see 40% um, wanted go big on a couple of streets. Um, another 12 said make some minor changes. And then 40% said go big everywhere. So of all the survey participants, only 6% said don't change anything. So that was really powerful data. And I see Samantha, our borough manager, is on the call here. So I'm gonna hand it over to her for the last part to talk about what our future plans are. Yeah, thank you, Kimberly. And um, yeah, thanks to everyone who is here tonight. Um, I'm coming off COVID, so I'm really glad I only have to talk about one slide here and just, uh, you know, bear with my congestion here for a few minutes. Um, yeah, the borough has, you know, been really proud to partner with the Narber Cycling Club. They provide a lot of capacity for all those events that Kimberly spoke about and all the other um, initiatives they've helped make happen that there's no way the borough on its own would have been able to um, to do. And um, and they've really helped shift the conversation, um, you know, in terms of what sort of policies and what sort of um, implementation steps are possible for the borough to do as shown in those 
uh, public surveys where they've helped, you know, shift the opinion of people towards being in favor of these uh, bicycle uh, improvements. So going forward, I mean, the message that the borough has taken from this is that we've done pilots and it's time to you know, do something permanent for the community. And a lot of people are really excited about that. And so the biggest thing the borough needs to do in order to do that is figure out what, what does that actually mean? Now that we've done a couple pilots, does it mean contrafoil lanes? Does it mean protected lanes? Um, and that's where we're really hoping some future planning can really help us out here. Um, so we're looking into things like the recent uh, TCDI grant application. We're looking at the federal funds for the Safe Streets program that was recently announced. We're partnering with Lower Marion Township on the Mainline Greenway, which is going to provide, <laughs> there's the train in Arbor, um, which is going to provide a really important connector, uh, you know, between a lot of different bike-friendly routes in the area. And as I mentioned, once we have a sense of what our planning is going to be, there's going to be work in the borough to install permanent bike routes and improvements. Uh, borough Council is going to be considering in the future, um, a, you know, a complete streets policy. And whenever we do any future road paving, we have an unofficial policy that multimodal transportation improvements, such as bicycle infrastructure, is going to be a part of that. And one of the other things that I think will be really exciting and that we'll definitely still need to work and, and enjoy working with the Narber Cycling Club on is these future community events. Again, that's one of the biggest things where the borough doesn't have the capacity on its own to do it, but by partnering with an organization like the Narber Cycling Club, we can do a lot of things that show people what this infrastructure is and show people that they can get around Narber on a bicycle uh, they, you know, to take that fear away of, of what biking might mean for a lot of people. So I think the future for biking and multimodal transportation in Narber Borough is really bright, and it's a stark difference to where it was five or six years ago. And without the Narber Cycling Club working with the borough and without the borough following up on what the cycling club has done, I don't think that would have been possible. So one powerful thing I just want to mention, years ago when Montgomery County Planning Commission was working on the Bike Monco plan, I had the opportunity to sit on the steering committee. And this piece of data that's always stuck in my mind and has, has I've added it to every conversation I can, is about untapped potential. So the county had surveyed maybe 2,500 residents in, in Montgomery County and what stood out to me was there was approximately 77% of survey respondents that said they were curious to use a bicycle to navigate Montgomery County, but they were feeling very cautious, curious, but concerned. And so it just shows you that by building some support around bicycling, creating these community rides, these community events, it helps to show people the way. Um, and with support from Montgomery County, Narberth really has begun to take some actionable steps towards some implementation that I really think is going to create a way for that 77% of the population that wants to get on a bike to then feel safe and excited to hop on a bike and, and move around the county. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Kimberly. And thank you very much, Samantha, for being here tonight and being part of this and uh, giving us a little bit of your experience creating a culture of bicycle and walking in Narberth. We're gonna shift gears yet once again, and I wanna do this transition by mentioning something that Kimberly mentioned, which is Bike Monco, uh, the county's bicycling plan. It's an on-road bicycling plan, and the centerpiece of it is a planned bicycle network. It's a route of about, or it's a, a network of about 750 miles of uh, proposed bike lanes on all sorts of roads, uh, big and small, uh, owned by the county, the state, our municipalities. It's very wide ranging. And 
we need help as a county from our partners to help build that out over the long term. And so that's where Pottstown comes in. Pottstown has been a real leader in Montgomery County for over 20 years in actually building out physical bicycle facilities. And so we have two speakers representing Pottstown tonight. Uh, we have Ben Guthrie and we have Justin Keller. And so Ben is a project manager with traffic planning and design, which is ironically here in the Pottstown area. That's where they're headquartered. And uh, for Ben, his area of focus is improving safety and connectivity for people walking and biking. That's what he does as a professional engineer. And Justin, however, Justin serves as the borough manager for Pottstown. He's been here for quite a number of years already, uh, leading Pottstown on the staff side. Uh, he's also um, uh, in charge of the Pottstown Borough Authority, as well as being part of the board of PAVE, the Pottstown Area Economic Development Arm. Uh, so prior to his time with the borough, however, uh, Justin was the Regional Recreation Coordinator for the Pottstown Area Regional Recreation Committee. So he was involved in recreation, bicycling, walking, and he also spent over a decade in the private sector as a landscape architect and planning consultant for numerous municipalities in the Philadelphia area. So with that, Ben and Justin, like to call you both to uh, come up and uh, tell everyone here in the audience and here online about the many great things that Pottstown has been doing uh, during the early 2000s and, and the 2010s and up to today. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction. So I'm gonna start off by talking a little bit big picture about the Walk and Bike Pottstown project. I'm going to hand it off to Justin to really talk more about the implementation challenges along the way. So when we talk about the walk and bike pots down, we're here to talk about taking some of these great plans that have been talked about uh, this afternoon and putting them in the ground, building uh, bicycle, physical bike, bike infrastructure and the challenges that come along with implementing it. So walk and bike pots down was a really a collaborative effort. Uh, led by the borough and Pottstown School District, but with a ton of support from Montgomery County, the Pottstown Area Health and Wellness Foundation, PennDOT, DVRPC. It was truly a collaborative effort. And what's great about this project is it wasn't just building a single bike lane or a single trail, it was building out a whole network and a really rapid build out process that not just talked about getting from point A to point B, but that enabled people of all ages to get from lots of different Loca uh, locations to lots of different destinations, whether they were biking downtown or to the Schuylkill River Trail or to one of the neighborhood elementary schools or the Pottstown High School. Uh, the network was designed to be truly flexible and accommodate the needs of the whole community. Uh, so just a broad overview of the project, uh, there was existing bike lanes on High Street through the boroughs downtown. Uh, exist and what that, uh, the first step of the project was extending those bike lanes to connect out to the surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, in addition to that, there was a new separated bike lane built along Jackson Street and Roland Street, uh, more than a mile in length, fully separated from traffic, along with enhanced crossings at High Street and Beach Street. The rest of the network was built out uh, of bicycle boulevards, which are low speed, low volume streets where bicycles share the road with motorized traffic. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later in the presentation. So as the borough was developing this network, uh, what the project team looked at was finding the right treatment for the right street. Uh, so here's an example uh, of Jackson Street, which was a straight wide street uh, with some residential uses on one side, but uh, large stretches with no driveways and no intersections. Uh, so this was really a great opportunity to calm traffic, slow down traffic, uh, and add a separated bike lane by shifting the traffic lanes over and creating light space for a two-way bike lane on one side of the street, fully separated from traffic and from intersections. Here's an over, overhead view of a two-way separated bike lane. I think this is actually on Roland Street moving through the borough, but you can see some of the key elements from this overhead view here. Uh, in this case, all bicycle traffic happens on one side of the street to create the same effect as a side path or a trail. Uh, it's separated from moving traffic with paint and with flexible delineator posts. And where there are conflict areas, such as driveways or intersections, green paint calls attention to where bicycles are crossing so that there's no unexpected conflicts between a car pulling out and a bicycle traveling along the road. So a separated bike lane is great because at mid-block locations, it keeps you fully separated from traffic. 
but one of the biggest challenges is in the borough setting, you have a lot of intersections, a lot of driveways. And so getting the intersections right was really a key part of the project success here. Uh, so this is an example here of an intersection that wasn't just difficult to ride your bike on, it was difficult to walk across or even drive through. When we talked to, we talked to neighbors, to residents, uh, to the crossing guard at the nearest intersection, and we just heard horror stories from everybody we spoke to. Uh, so you can see what you have moving across the screen here is fast moving east to west traffic in multiple places where cars are trying to pull out from a stop sign with limited sight distance, with no clearly defined crosswalk, uh, with uh, certainly no defined area for bicycles. So what you see is the before picture here and in the upper right, the conceptual sketch that the project team came up with and the bottom right, the aerial photo following implementation. Uh, so the key to the success here was creating a smaller, more compact, always stop intersection within the larger intersection that not only created an opportunity for safe crosswalks and a, the two way bike lane to cross, but also made it safe for a heavy left turn movement that before was waiting at the stop sign for a chance to peel out and make their left turn to traffic, but now could comfortably make that left turn from an always stop configuration. So it really reduced conflicts across the board for everybody using the intersection. So one of the biggest challenges of implementing a bicycle network in a borough setting is parking is limited, street space is limited, and there's a huge sensitivity of any loss of a single parking spot. So again, the key was re really evaluating each individual street and picking the right treatment for that location. Uh, so you pick a different design option in neighborhoods where there's off-street parking and driveways compared to a street where on-street parking, every single spot is heavily utilized. Uh, you have to consider the speed and the volume of traffic on the road. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, one of the key treatments that we used in this plan was what's known as a bicycle boulevard. So you can see here, as opposed to the examples we looked at earlier with a fully separated bike lane, a bicycle boulevard is actually a low speed, low volume residential street uh, where bicycles may feel comfortable under existing conditions, mixing with low speed vehicle traffic. And with the right uh, signage, pavement markings, traffic calming, you can really enhance uh, that bicycling experience and draw a critical mass of cycling using these routes. Uh, so what I have here is really a key guidance in implementing, implementing these types of improvements uh, from two different federal guidelines. So on the right here, you see where you have low speeds, lower than 15 miles, lower than 25 miles per hour and fewer than 2,000 or 3,000 vehicles per day using the street. It's really a great candidate for a, a shared lane or bicycle boulevard. But as those speeds increase or the uh, amount of traffic over the course of the day increases, you, you really need some separation for people to be comfortable riding their bike in the street. So you would move to a bike lane. And once you get above 6,000 vehicles per day or above 30 miles per hour, you really need to provide some sort of separation to get pe uh, people riding bikes separated from cars. So again, with guidance like this, we were able to ident identify the right streets to accommodate uh, bicycles without necessarily needing bike lanes. So with that background, I'm gonna pass off to Justin to talk a little bit more of the challenges of implementing uh, a bicycle network. Thank you, Ben, appreciate it. And um, thank you all. Welcome to Pottstown. Um, we're really proud of our borough here and what we've been able to accomplish. Um, Thank you to Montgomery County for picking Pottstown to hold this uh, event here tonight. Um, for me, it uh, certainly beats giving uh, national press conferences. <laughs> for, if you've followed the borough in the past uh, couple of weeks or so. So this is a um, breath of fresh air to be able to present here tonight to all, to all of you folks. Um, so yeah, I mean, Really, I think Kimberly's approach is the way to go. Um, do it that way. Don't do it the way that we did it. Uh, we kind of just jumped in and we said, hey, I'm a bike guy. Ben knows about bikes. We're just going to do it. It's the right thing to do. All the studies, all the data points that way, right? But we never took the time to really build that uh, advocacy with, with the resident. So um, it, 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 it wasn't always easy, but we... Um, we, we persevered, uh, we stayed true to our, our goal and we, and we got through it, but it definitely would have helped had we, had we taken the time to kind of build that coalition because the coalition exists. It exists in every community. You've just gotta, you've just gotta find them. 
and put them together. Um, because on, on a lot of the conversations and, and the decisions, it was it was just like, well, the borough is telling us to do this, but the residents want to do that. It would have been great to have that kind of that kind of mediator. So probably one of the most controversial items were these delineators that are shown here in this in this picture. Um, I think that you know, as I mentioned on the bus tour on, on Jackson Street, which uh, has the you know, parts of the Hill School, parts of uh, the golf course, not not as um, a little more dense residential development. We didn't get a lot of complaints about the appearance of the delineators, but once we started to get into um, less dense residential development, that's that's kind of where we ran into some roadblocks with with the appearance of of these things. But um, basically, this is required whenever you have um, three feet or, or or less, and you have a a, a bi-directional bike lane. Um, that is going on one side of the street or the other, and this is to create a visual barrier. So not a physical barrier. You know, it's not something that's going to protect people from getting hit, but a visual, a visual barrier. Um, there were things thrown out that it was going to, it was going to devalue my property. That, you know, well, we're going to, we're going to go rip them out as soon as you guys put them in. <laughs> I mean, all, all this stuff. Um, none of that has come to fruition. Um, and actually, the, the year. After we, we built this, um, there were some properties that sold on this street and on Roland Street that were 10 to 50 10 to 15 percent higher um, than what they had sold a couple years prior. And this was, you know, what were we, 2019, 18 time frame. So, you know, the market wasn't the way that it was now. Um, and uh, so what we tried to do work with them originally, the engineers, um, they, they proposed a yellow delineator. Uh, we tried to soften it up by using a white color, to be a little bit less intrusive. Now we did talk a lot about alternatives. What else could we use? And there's really good alternatives out there depending on your situation, um, such as a vegetative um, strip that could be you know, shrubbery, perennials, grasses, things like that, or even something as simple as a post and rail fence. The main thing that you're trying to create here is that visual barrier between the vehicle travel lanes and, and the bicycle lanes. Um, we, we ended up going with this for, you know, we were already chewing on a, what, $2.1 million plus uh, project that, you know, actually I want to give credit to the, the county too. Um, they were able to help us out at the end. Uh, our project went a little bit over and the county graciously stepped in and, and helped us kind of get to the completion there and make that connection to the school corridor trail. Um, but, uh, you know, we really had to look at how we were going to do this in the most cost effective way for the borough, because we were trying to cover as much area as possible. So we went, we went with the delineators in these kinds of, uh, situations, um, for the vegetative, uh, I'm, it looks beautiful. I've seen it in other places, but the, the installation, the upfront cost is going to be a lot more. And then your ongoing maintenance is, is going to be a lot more in the long run too. So it depends on kind of what, what you're going for and how much um, funding you might have you might have available there. Uh, the other common question that we got from residents was about maintenance, trash pickup, snow removal, um, because essentially, you know, all these things change a little bit when you have a bike lane next next year, uh, next year property. Um, the one thing that we took out of that was, you know, for the trash containers, you know, and turning radii from, from the driveway where you have the, the visual barriers, the delineator, the vegetation, make sure you leave a little bit of room for people to pull their trash can out to the edge of the edge of the travel lanes um, can also help if, if they need to pile some snow there in the wintertime. But most importantly, it gives them a, a, a turning radii because the last thing you want to do is have them too tight. Um, which will then they'll get hit and the public works crews will have to come out and, and replace them, which isn't a big deal. They're fairly um, straightforward to uh, re replace. And I think that definitely we had our, a good number hit right, right at the beginning, a good number knocked out. And, um, but that has seemed to kind of subside over the years as people have gotten used to uh, seeing them there and kind of how the traffic circulates and, and everything else. Um, some of it might have been out of spite too. I don't know, but <laughs> that's besides the point. Um, so the separated bike lanes, um, they are going to be more challenging to maintain. So, so things like a separated trail, 
or a cycle track like we saw in Jackson and Roller Rolling Street. The main thing you wanna make sure is that you've got a 12 foot wide uh, travel lane in there so that you can get a street sweeper down that. That's really the most efficient way to, to, to clean it up uh, on a periodic basis. Um, now, the delineators do present another challenge because we get in the winter time and, and just the deterioration of the roadway, we get the grit that accumulates between the delineators. So what we've started doing is prior to the street sweeper getting there, we'll have our guys go out and uh, leaf blow between the delineators. They'll take a leaf blower, they'll blow all the grit to the curb, and then we'll have the street sweeper come down through so that we get everything nice, nice and tidy. Um, you're going to have things like down trees, down, down branches, uh, leaves, you know, really nothing any different than what you're already, your public works crews are already dealing with on the streets. So they'll just do the same thing for, for a uh, trail. Um, the snow removal, we've decided not to do winter maintenance um, on, our, on our separated uh, bike lanes, partially because of financial concerns. Um, we do feel that there are less riders uh, in the winter time that, that would be benefiting um, from that, but most importantly, we had no, we have nowhere to go with the snow in some of these, in some of these conditions. And that is, that is something to consider because a lot of times your, your uh, snow removal team will try to push this, the snow on the shoulder of the road, but not on the resident's sidewalk. Um, I mean, we've, I've heard stories, we had the plow guys go through and dump a bunch of snow on somebody's sidewalk and people start throwing snowballs at them. So you don't want to be in that, in that situation. But a bike lane will take up um, some of that ability to pile the snow on, on the shoulder uh, of the road. But from a plus side, not doing winter maintenance, it does mean that uh, we can avoid um, when we plow putting the snow onto people's sidewalks where then they have to, maybe they've already shoveled, they've got to reshovel re it again. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, so that's kind of how we treat them. Now, the regular bike lanes that aren't separated on high street, um, on York street, on the other ones, uh, we do, we do plow those on the share of the road routes, just like we would a, re a regular, you know, vehicle lane for, for the most part. Um, and one thing you do want to wa watch out for is where you pile the snow. If you do pile it near near the bike lane and um, you, you do try to have winter maintenance, you've got to probably come back and address it for freeze thaw, icing, um, and address it with salt. So those are just some of uh, the winter maintenance uh, tips to, to put out there. The other thing that, uh, that we did was, since this was a partnership with the school district, we wanted to make sure that the children, and maybe even more importantly, that the parents were going to be very comfortable with, with their children, children using this system. Um, so we were able to get a 20,000 grant through the Health and Wellness Foundation um, to create wayfinding signing, signage along the routes, also provide maps that can illustrate the, route, the routes for students that were given to them in handouts and um, pamphlets. And then we did a couple presentations uh, to the students and parents to demonstrate how to safely use our new our new network. Um, we uh, put a lot of time and effort into this. We really wanted people to use it. So the educational piece was really, really helpful to help this get off the ground and also to quell some of the public concern as well um, initially. And I think, you know, back when we did it, certainly bike lanes are more widely accepted now, um, but to just quell some of the concerns of, well, who's really going to use this? And, you know, that's again, where I get back to having a a champion in, in town um, would really help you kind of speak to that a little bit. But, you know, we, those of us that were on the bus tour today, I mean, we, we saw people using them today. So, it, you know, we didn't plan that or anything. It's just a random day and um, the weather's warm, and people use them. So they are getting, they are getting well used. Um, and then a part of that, we did incentives for our students. So things like uh, if you, ride your bike to school on this day, we'll do, we did a raffle and we would give out a bike helmet or we would give out a free bike. So to really kind of encourage that, uh, that ridership. And then we also did a bike rodeo where we were able to bring in the, uh, the police department and we had real life scenarios of how the children would navigate these bike lanes laid out in, in the bike rodeo. So not only did it give them kind of a practice run to learn the rules of the road, um, it also allowed our police department to have a one-on-one -on -one interaction with the school children, which is also very important for their community building 
uh, efforts as, as well. Um, there were pamphlets that were made out, made up um, on safe biking, traffic laws, and the route maps. You know, really, at the end of the day, it's probably it, it, it's everyone has a different ability, and every parent and child has a different comfort level. And at the end of the day, you know, it's got to be up to them whether they think that they're comfortable riding that that particular route. It depends on their age, their skill set. You know, certainly, we're not going to see a lot of this until you get into the older elementary ages, but then definitely, you know, more, more so in the, in the middle and, and the high school ages. But this program was open to all of the, um, the rodeo was open to all the elementary students, right, Courtney? Right. Um, and I think we did some presentations and things like that for the, for the other schools. So um, that's pretty much concludes my portion of the presentation. And, um, you know, before we open it up to questions and concerns, uh, I, any of you that would like to stick around after, feel free to go to our downtown, check out our restaurants there, check out our beer gardens. Um, we've really come a long way in the, in the past five years. Thank you. Any questions? We're actually going to do the Q&A. I want you guys to say after. Sure. How long did you take a seat? If you ever get first dibs on those five seats. Right. And uh, I'll have the rest of the speakers with you. So you come on. Uh, Samantha is online, so you can't come sit in the seat. Uh, but uh, Jeff and Kimberly, why don't you come uh, join us at the table? So we're going to shift to a, a brief question and answer. This is what we're going to do first. We're gonna, I'm going to ask maybe one or two questions of our panel with an answer, just to kick things off. Uh, and then we'll open up to the audience, both online and here in person, and give you all the opportunity for our guests tonight. Uh, to be able to ask questions and speak. So I'm going to hand this off to Anne. And then I will move here to the different microphone. And so uh, I'm going to ask, start off by asking our panel. Uh, and I'll, I'll ask each of you guys to think about this and then respond. So you're, no one's hiding, right? First question is this. What did it take to convince your municipal officials to embrace walking and bicycling? And as a second part, was there a turning point? So um, I, I think that uh, in that season before we even had the um, this, this was because uh, to our walking school district, we were on staff. Um, about five or 10 years prior to the bike lane discussion, um, we, had, we had some serious conversations about what to do with our neighborhood elementary schools. And um, there was one proposal to combine them all into one location of elementary school. We decided to keep what we had um, because it was more uh, inclusive for walking and biking and healthier uh, lifestyle for the community. So I think had that decision been made otherwise, setting up the, this town-wide bike lane system would have been a totally different, totally different school. And um, as far as the, the turn I think that once we once we got the grant and, and you know, once the council and others see that hey, we turned off the, the two million dollars all our food for this, um, we want to kind of do the showcase of this as well for our future events and things. Um, that's where our, our council really I think stepped in. Okay. That was a great answer. Just to add a little bit, I think that the in general, one thing that helps is the work we provide is not just as a bike provider. A lot of people don't think of themselves as a bicyclist, but we all walk where we want to go. We think of us walking towards our walk short walk. A lot more people can see themselves as a walker than a biker. And even people who live on the street appreciate cars slowing it down. But I think the more you can show how it improves safety for everybody and not think it's a bicycle provider, I think that can make a difference. So. I, I think for Providence, we need to from 2017 to 2018, we were dealing with a, a relatively brand new building that was extremely underutilized as a community center. Um, the supervisors at the time said, well, we want to put a survey out to see what people want to use the community center for. And to everyone's surprise, when the survey company came back with, you know, what are the, what are the, the, the questions, uh, what is the one thing this township needs more than anything? 
there was a whole bunch of recreation use, there's a whole bunch of um, classes and things like that listed. Trails, which I had asked to have put in there, just to sort of see where it lived, ended up at 73%. Nothing else came above 20%. So at, at that point, everybody's like, oh, maybe we need to refocus a little bit. So, and, and that's where we've been the last four or five years. It took a little bit of a step back during COVID, but we're still, you know, working off of that same survey. I think in our when we really stopped to take a look at all of the regional connections that were starting to come about, the circuit trails, school board trail being part of that, our very nearby Canada Heritage Trail being part of the, the circuit trail network, the conversation really started to grow around how can you bike from an arbor to this trailhead without getting in your car? Because folks would put their bike on their car, they get to the trailhead, the parking lot would be full, they would turn around and go home. So really just creating those connections to make it safe to bike on really quiet neighborhood streets um, is, was the turning part for Narber. And in addition to that, doing those community events, doing that one day Earth Day pop up where people could actually come and experience the difference between riding in a buffered or protected space on the road versus sharing the road ride. I think allowing them an opportunity to, to reimagine how our streets could be utilized in that. All right, thank you guys. One final question from me and then we'll open it up to the audience. And it's this, I'm gonna call on each of you guys to go down the row again. So what is your biggest challenge to with Justin, uh, you know, implementing these improvements? What's your biggest challenge to implementing them? Uh, Jeff, what's your biggest challenge uh, to uh, planning for these things? And Kimberly, what is your biggest challenge to building that culture and working with individuals and people? Yeah, so uh, right now, I mean, I think our, uh, I don't even call it the challenge, it's the one system that really just means, uh, you know, uh, making sure that they're really uh, look good, making sure that the changes are actually mentioned before, uh, if they're not talking to the connection, some of the things that, um, so that's, that's really the, the, the biggest uh, challenge that we have right now. Um, Kind of second layer to that is I think because we were so ambitious, there is a little bit of quite waiting fatigue after the um, and that's you know you see lots of people in the central public pressure that. So we're kind of at a point where we feel we're in a really good position to still go to trail and we want to rest on the highway. Just the power of connection to the location of the I think it is next year. Um, so we feel like we've got pretty good connectivity to most of our region. We've got one uh, pocket out on, on the west side that we could probably do a little bit more, a little bit more work on. Um, but I think now would be the question if we want to do another one. You know, we already have all these done. Why would we need to do more? So I think it's really hard. I think for our province right now, the, the biggest challenge is it's finding those spaces that we can still put a trail. Um, like with land development, where we want trails to go in and where the connections we want to have, it's not an easy place to put a trail, whether it's across a, somewhat of an you know, somewhat undeveloped piece of property, but it's against a lot of people's backyards. Everybody wants a trail unless it's going across their backyard. That's going to have an issue with it. So it, it's getting past that, and it's, it's finding those locations where we can effectively put in a trail, where we cost effectively put in a trail. We're going back and forth with a section right now that 113 is one of the main spines at the center of the township. The, you know, the speed limit on the road is, is 45, probably the average speed on that road is 65. And there's a few houses that have been there since, you know, probably the 1940s or 1950s that are right up on the road. And there's some wetlands and some low spots. So it's a challenge to find it, 
you know, do we put it on that road and, and, and how do we do it like the cross town did with, with the, 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 the eliminators and things like that? Or do we go on the other side of the main residential area that borders 113 and run it along an open space and along the people's backyards? And, and it's, it's just a challenge to get where can we cost effectively use our money to make these connections? Again, while we every two years we try to cycle in a development, we you know we design in one year and we go for grants the next year. We're working on that 113 corridor now, and we're really sort of stuck. We're trying to work with a landowner. Um, there's a very large open space in the middle of the township that was a, it's a Christmas tree farm, and while it's a preserved open space, it's still a business, and the gentleman that owns it doesn't want people walking along. One portion of this property that would make for a very easy, convenient trail to put in, he's afraid that, well, people are just going to walk that trail, cut off that side of the property, and come take over Christmas tree or any other tree that you've got in there. So we're, we're working through those processes, and that's our biggest challenge. It's finding where we can actually fit the trail to make the connections. I'm actually trying to sit here and think about what a challenge is right now. I think that. In 2016, I would have had an answer for you. And now we have so much momentum behind us that I can't even tell. I think that in 2016, I came in from having lived in other places where I had lots of safe, convenient bicycling, and I saw such potential in Narvers, and the folks there didn't necessarily see it. Um, and for me, having to be patient and develop those partnerships and those relationships to get the buy-in took a lot of tiny, tiny incremental changes that at the time I didn't really think were meaningful. And now looking back, I realize they were so essential. So I can't say I have a challenge now. If anything, this active transportation plan that the borough is seeking grant funding to secure um, I think really it's going to be that next pivot point to see the real physical implementation of the open space in the Well, thank you, Kimberly, for your honesty. <laughs> Excellent. At this point, we're going to open it up to the audience that is here in person and has the portable microphone. And she will walk over if anyone has a question, feel free to raise your hand after that. We'll check online and see if there's anyone in the chat that has a question. So audience first. Jeff, I'm going to restate that just for the audience on here who sure. may have a hard time hearing our microphone. I'm told that doesn't always come through well. So the question was, uh, Jeff had mentioned earlier about PICO changing their policy about trails. And uh, what's some of the background about that? Why is that? Is that correct? Go ahead, Jeff. I can't really speak to why PICO changed the policy. And it really it applies to like you know, high power lines. I mean, if it's an average residential line, I don't think that's an issue. If we're relatively close to the limit generating plant. And we have a large, uh, I guess, you know, high tension lines that go through the middle of our township. I, I, my guess is that it's a safety issue that they don't want people walking in that area. Um, I, I can't speak to what their rationale is. We have been talking to them. It was always a challenge to get any sort of conversation out of them, but occasionally when they would need something from us, we'd bring that up and say, hey, look, how about we, we start talking about this? And we'd get a couple of emails and then it would peter out. Um, and, we were told, I think we were sent in information by, was it by, the, by Montgomery County, it might have been, that, that, they, that they changed their policy and that they, they were no longer doing that. Um, our rationale, we, we think it would make, you know, if they want access roads and they want, if they're going to pave in there to go look at their power lines and inspect the power lines, we're happy to put those eight foot wide roads in for you, let us use it as a trail, and, and you, you, know, you can use the roads, we'll maintain them, and, and they don't. We, and actually we just put in a pumping station relatively close to that. And, and it was enough of a challenge to get an easement through there to a property that was landlocked where we were putting a pumping station. So I think it comes and goes with PICO as it does with any public agency. There, sometimes the policy is, hey, let's open it up, let's do what we can. And I think other times they, 
they tend to shut it down for whatever reason. And, and I can't speak to what that is. No, uh, they, in this case, they own the property. I mean, they own the property, it's simple, and, and there, there's nothing I can, if it was an easement, I guess we could take into court over the easement or something like that. If we, you know, if we were an underlying property owner or if the underlying property owner was willing to do that. But this is a, a section of property that, that's maybe 75 to 100 feet wide by probably a mile, two miles long. It's not a developable piece of property and they own it outright. So like with any other property, I can't, I mean, I guess I could try having a domain with Pico, but I don't think that's a fight I'm gonna win or try. Uh, I'll just add a little bit more context. Um, Pico has backtracked a little bit uh, since that edict sort of went out. The edict is probably too strong of a word. It's more like a statement. Uh, and essentially, they've said you can have trails, but they've um, tightened the requirements that a municipality or the county or anyone else would have to follow in order to put a trail in. So, uh, yeah, we're still working through that with them. Jeff is, the county is, our other partners are as well. Do we have another question? Uh, actually, I actually have two questions. One real quickly is the record of Kimberly. Is the last slide who had uh, a grant from TTEI? Do you, do you know what that acronym stands for? And then the other one quickly is the record of Justin. And what's your experience with snow removal? What is the name of the grant? I know you have a snow here, but. Okay, for, for the audience's sake online, uh, first question was, Kim, was directed to Kimberly. What does TCDI stand for or, or what is that about? And the other one was to Justin about what has been your experience clearing snow from the delineators. Yeah, it's Transportation Community Development Initiatives. I think that's right. And as a citizen, I guess it's great that I should know what that means. But, um, in Narberth, we have a grid where they have a main line that has a really strong identity linked to uh, public transportation. So, the borough is currently seeking some grant assistance funding to, uh, for an active transportation plan that would create opportunities for connections to the train station plus the different uh, transportation corridors in, in the borough and just outside of. Yeah, thank you for the question about when it when it so um I, I should have covered this in a little more detail in the presentation, but uh, on our uh, uh separated flight train services request, we actually do not do clearance because uh we felt like we Need to get a special piece of equipment to be able to do that. Um, issues with we go in there and where we pile the snow, we don't want to pile up on the sidewalk, on the sidewalk side. We don't want to push it in the middle because now our pile is potentially hit. Um, really, what my crew has told me is that we, we can almost need to get like a, like a motor in there. Or, or a snow blow attachment for your um, uh, backpack that you could run it if you could run it. We are our standard cloud from from a dog, so we just wait to get to get in there. And so we just decided uh, not to do that. Um, All right, any other audience questions? So the question for Justin was, is the borough able to track the number of people using uh, the bike lanes that you've discussed today? We have, I mean, that, that's an interesting, um, interesting idea though, but what we have tracked our users uh, on the specific trail. We have, you know, we have a very good idea of what's happening. Um, but no, yeah, we, have, we really haven't tracked the number of, of users there. I think it's a little more difficult because on like, a specific trail, you can just put out a point that's just 
All right, let's shift to our online visitors here and uh, see what uh, has come up. There is one in the Q&A. This is from Peter Simone. Uh, he says, every project and community needs a champion, and Pottstown had that in Tom Hilton. His foundation, Save Our Land, Save Our Towns, and financed the completion of the master plan. Once the master plan was completed, he wrote the successful Ice-T grant and sought and obtained matching funds from the Pottstown Wellness Foundation. At the time, the borough administration and council smartly followed along. Due largely to Tom's relentless efforts in leading the way, his vision is today a reality. Thank you, Tom. So praise for Tom Hilton, one of the civic uh, pioneers who helped create the things that Justin talked about today. So there are no more open questions. We'll go to the chat briefly. And I don't see any questions in the chat. So at that point, I'm going to turn it over to Scott France, our executive director, to close us out. And here comes Scott. Thank you. We're just about at seven o'clock, so good timing. And thank you so much, everyone, for giving us your time tonight and sharing that information. It was really a great uh, set of information from all of you. Um, I hope that everyone found this uh, you know, useful and, and their experiences to be uh, both practical and informative. Uh, I do want to thank the Hill School for allowing us to hold our Planning Smarter event here tonight. In particular, special thanks to Anna Taylor for her technical assistance behind the scenes. And, this has run about as smoothly as you ever expect these to run. So great, great job, this, this has been wonderful. And uh, I also want to remind everyone that the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission has allowed us to use uh, their uh, credits to establish AICP education credits. If you are a, a member of APA, you get 1.5 credits for tonight. The number is on the program. Uh, you can just fill that out online. And we do have food in the back for those who are here. Uh, please feel free to uh, enjoy. Take some home. We've got plenty, I'm sure. Um, and uh, again, enjoy Pottstown. And thanks so much for coming out. It's great to see everyone.